In 2010, the National Audit Office produced a report on patient care on military operations. It commented that the exemplary level of trauma care for military patients was demonstrated by the number of unexpected survivors. What did they mean by that? What is an unexpected survivor? It's a casualty whose injury severity score is so high that statistically he or she would be expected to die, but doesn't. So why don't they? Well, over the next few minutes, I'm going to highlight some of the lessons we learned in over a decade of conflict in Afghanistan that contributed to that number of unexpected survivors. This is from a patient record form. This soldier and his team were clearing a compound in the early hours of the morning in January 2010. An improvised explosive device detonated, blew off both his legs, it caused shrapnel injuries to his arms and a significant head injury. He was hypovolemic with a barely palpable carotid pulse. His airway was compromised and his GCS was low. But he is an unexpected survivor. So why didn't he die? <coughs> Let's start here. Lesson one, rewrite the alphabet. When your patients are doing their very best to bleed to death because they're missing multiple limbs, the clinical priority has to change to one of stopping bleeding. The ABCDE with which we are all so familiar from ALS, ATLS and the like was no longer appropriate. So we rewrote the alphabet to start with big C or the control of catastrophic hemorrhage such that our patients didn't bleed out and they would have bled to death long before their airway was compromised. Lesson two, when your patients will bleed to death before reaching the hospital, you have to be able to stop the bleeding in the field. We use direct pressure, combat application tourniquets or CATs for short, and novel hemostatics. Every serviceman and woman in Afghanistan carried three of these tourniquets on their person. Every serviceman and woman in Afghanistan was trained to not only use these on themselves if necessary, but also on their teammates. And I have no doubt that the immediate first aid provided by the mates and teammates of the wounded was a first process in saving life. We also use novel hemostatics. Obviously, you can't always use a tourniquet because you might not be able to get the tourniquet above the injury. Simple direct pressure might not be enough. We started out using Hemcon and Quick Clot, but evolved to using Celox gauze due to its versatility to be packed into wounds without causing an exothermic reaction. Lesson three, take the hospital to the patient. The medical emergency response team Chinook, or the MERT Chinook, was way more than just a flying ambulance capable of carrying up to eight stretchers. It was more like a flying emergency department, staffed by a doctor, an emergency nurse and two paramedics, along with four aircrew, two pilots, two loadmasters, and four RAF regimental gunners who kept us safe. We were able to provide advanced interventions, intravenous or intraosseous access, rapid sequence induction of anaesthesia, thoracostomies, high quality analgesia with morphine, ketamine or fentanyl. And in massive haemorrhage, we were able to give the first gram of tranexamic acid and start the one-to-one -one transfusion. So why did we use one-to-one? -one? Well, the evidence still isn't entirely clear as to the optimal ratio of blood and FFP, and indeed platelets. For example, Holcomb's paper in JAMA last year looked at using either one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, that's blood, FFP platelets, or two-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. Now it's worth saying that the Americans don't pool their platelets. So that is a single donation of platelets that is the one that's more like six to six to one in the UK. His paper didn't show any differences in mortality either at 24 hours or at 30 days. But what it did show that in the one-to-one -one group, more patients achieved sorry, hemostasis and fewer patients died from exsanguination in the first 24 hours. Now patients bleed whole blood, they don't bleed components but it does seem sensible to be able to replace what they've lost with components that come as close to possible as matching whole blood. And in fact, in the Royal Three Hospital at Camp Bastion, we could actually give fresh whole blood from a donor panel, all pre-screened and mostly made up of hospital staff. And we don't know if pre-hospital blood is the right thing. 
A recent meta-analysis showed that it didn't make a difference. But again, it seems intuitive to replace our patients' circulating volumes and probably contributed to the number of unexpected survivors, but there were many confounding variables. And I'm hoping that the refill trial will give us a much more definitive answer as to whether pre-hospital blood and blood products is the way ahead. Lesson four, have the most capable team you can. For the vast majority of the conflict in Afghanistan, there were two main platforms bringing patients to the Royal Three Hospital, the MERT, the UK team of doctor, nurse and two paramedics flying in a Chinook helicopter, and the Pedros, the US Air Force team consisting of two Pavehawk helicopters, each staffed by two para-jumpers. So what's a para-jumper? Well, they're not just paramedics. They're divers, they're underwater rescue specialists, they're mountain experts, they're freefall parachutists as well as paramedics. Their training is referred to as Superman School, and the Pedro's motto is that others may live. This paper looks at the outcomes of patients who were brought to the hospital, either by the Mert or by the Pedro's. And as you can see, the overall mortality and injury severity scores are really not that different. However, when you stratify for injury severity score, the most severely injured patients were less likely to die when they were picked up by the Mert's very capable team. So, lesson five, train hard, fight easy. That capable team doesn't just happen. That capable team has to learn how to work together as a team. The training started months and months before any of us set foot in Afghanistan, and it culminated in hospex a week-long exercise in North Yorkshire in a mock-up of Camp Bastion's Roll 3 Hospital where the deploying staff were subjected to the very worst day in Afghanistan. The team came together, the team trained together. We got to know each other's strengths and weaknesses. We learned pretty quickly how to wind each other up as well as how everybody took their tea. We knew the kit inside out, we knew exactly where to lay our hands on it in the back of the aircraft, such that we could reach it easily in daylight or working under the blue light of head torches at night. And that team coming together was probably one of the most important things because we practiced and practiced and practiced for as many possible scenarios as possible. But one can never truly work out what ever could happen in a war zone because it's somewhat unpredictable. Lesson six. You can't save them all. We all have patients who stick in our minds more than others. And sometimes it's not because it was a great save. It's because we couldn't save a life. Sometimes our best just simply isn't enough <coughs> because of the catastrophic nature of the patient's injuries. This young man was blown up by an improvised explosive device. Both legs were amputated and he suffered significant pelvic floor trauma. From a Mert point of view, it was a textbook job. Nothing could have gone better. However, he died on the operating table when it became apparent that his injuries were so severe that they were unsurvivable. The outcome of the debrief and the clinical governance meeting where all deaths were discussed was that bad stuff happens. It hit us all hard. We looked out for each other. We looked after each other. We were kind to each other and we were kind to ourselves. Lesson seven. However hard the lesson may be, every patient teaches us something, so learn your lessons well. This is known as the magic unicorn slide. And this is the rainbow colored mane of that mythical beast. It plots probability of survival against new injury severity score for a decade in Afghanistan. Each different colored line is a different year. As you can see, over time, the number of survivors increased and the number of unexpected survivors increased. This was due to a culture of learning lessons from every patient and disseminating those lessons, such we just got better and better at what we did. Towards the end of the conflict, the Royal Three Hospital at Camp Bastion was the leading trauma centre in the world. And 97.8% of patients who reached the hospital with a pulse survived. This is Corporal Ricky Ferguson. 
He is the unexpected survivor whose patient record form you saw at the start of the talk. This photo was taken on the day he received his military cross from the Queen. He'd been awarded it for some incredible acts of bravery in the weeks before he was injured. I hadn't seen him since I dropped him off to the trauma team at the hospital, so I went to say hello. I introduced myself, and his mum took my hand and said thank you for saving his life. And Ricky said, are you the one that gave me the really good drugs? <laughs> I am hugely proud to have worked with such a phenomenal multinational team all working together with one common cause. And that common cause was to save life. Thank you.